Welcome to Glen Ferris Inn with dining with Dan and Becky. Uh, tonight I have as my guest Ken Linehart and his wife Shirley and the famous major Tom Willis over there on the end. And uh, Tom, tell us about uh, your guest here as well uh, a little bit. Well, we're very honored to have Kent and Shirley join us tonight. As you may know, Kent is the current uh, Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of West Virginia. And uh, so I would uh, like to introduce them. And, and Kent, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you very much, uh, Tom and Dan. And Becky. I mean, this is a great honor to be here. We're looking forward to a, a delicious meal. Uh, Shirley and I, uh, we have a farm in uh, western end of Monongalia County, and we bought that farm while I was still on active duty with the United States Marine Corps, and we started to uh, restore that farm. The farm was abandoned in 1957, and we restored it to, uh, to full production and expanded it uh, after I retired from the Marines in 1996. Uh, since then, we've been uh, just enjoying the good old life in West Virginia with the, with the farm, and the, something got over me. I don't know what happened. I ended up in politics, and now I am uh, fortunate enough to be the Commissioner of Agriculture, and my wife Shirley retired from Panasonic Corporation uh, about the same time I retired from the Marine Corps, and together we restored that farm. Now, Dan is also a Marine Corps veteran, and Kent is a Marine Corps veteran, so we strategically play Shirley right here in between us to keep the Marines away from the Army guy. So Shirley, we appreciate your bravery. <laughs> uh, not a being problem, very... not a problem. Okay, well, let's go back in the kitchen and uh, see what Becky has made up for us and we'll get started on our meal tonight. Hello, I'm Becky, and welcome back to Dining with Dan and Becky, and welcome to the Inn again. Uh, tonight, our menu is just a little bit different, and you're going to have to be a little bit patient with me because these, some of them are really old recipes. Alright, our menu is going to be a stuffed lettuce salad, which we've done before. Esther Hazy steak, which no one has done before. Mashed potatoes, everyone's favorite. Spanish madeleine, and a beet cake, which used to be extremely popular, but now uh, it, it just isn't out there for people to prepare, eat, and enjoy. So we're gonna go over that tonight. Now, we have always talked about how much time it takes. Stuffed lettuce isn't very difficult to do, so we're gonna do it later on in the show. Esther Hazy steak is a type of a baked steak, so that needs to be done very soon. Mashed potatoes, will do those towards the end. Spinach madeleine has to be baked, but it's only for 45 minutes and the beet cake has to be prepared and then baked and cooled and then frosted. So we're gonna start out with the beet cake. All right, now beet cake is one of the more unusual desserts that has come about in colonial America. Now it is very similar to a pineapple, I'm sorry, it's very similar to a carrot cake. The beet cake, because the beets are so red and rich, makes the batter a, a bright red batter, which darkens as you bake it. This was the original red velvet cake, and it was a, a staple in fine American dining all the way up to the time when red food coloring came about. And then at that time when cocoa became prevalent, that is when they developed the recipe for the red velvet cake that we use today. But this was the colonial version of the red velvet cake. Now for a beet cake, you will need 
four eggs, two cups of sugar, one cup of vegetable oil, two cups of flour, one teaspoon of baking powder, one and a half teaspoons of baking soda, a half a teaspoon of salt, one tablespoon of cinnamon, half a cup of milk, two teaspoons of vanilla, and three cups of shredded beets, just like your carrots are shredded in a carrot cake, and then one cup of chopped pecans. And welcome back. In olden days, in the 17 and 1800s and early 1900s in even, you made a cake out of a three bowl method. First, you would take your, your sugar and your butter and cream it together. Then you'd combine all your dry ingredients, then all of your wet ingredients in another bowl. And then once you have all three bowls done, then you combine them in a one bowl for your batter. Now we don't have to do that unless it's a, a sponge cake or an angel food cake or a rich pound cake. All we have to do is have one bowl and a good mixer. So we have got four eggs, two cups of sugar, one cup of vegetable oil, and this is canola, two cups of flour, and then all of your dry ingredients. This contains your baking powder, baking soda, salt, and cinnamon. Then we have got half a cup of whole milk, one cup of chopped pecans, and three cups of shredded beets. And as I was shredding these, I just thanked God that I had a food processor. Uh, I have never really shredded beets before. I've shredded carrots, but that's about it. Oh, and all the ingredients for chow chow. Now, since we have such dry ingredients in here, what I'm going to do is just turn it on and turn it off for a little bit until the liquids start mixing. I do not like my dry ingredients being thrown all over my kitchen. And I bought a guard to go on it, but for some reason it just didn't work at the house. Okay. So let me get a spatula and here we go. All right, now we should be able to mix this. Now remember when taking it out, you put it on low speed and barely lift it so that the centrifugal force of the beater going around will throw the batter or frosting, whatever you're making, into the bowl and you will have a much less of a mess. So let's turn it off, release our bowl, and look at this, nice and red. Now as this bakes, it's going to turn brown, much like a carrot cake, only a little bit darker. I 
I do not often make carrot cakes and beet cakes. That's true. But I also like zucchini bread. I like banana bread. Not everything has to be made out of a fruit for an unusual bread. Now this is going to bake at 350 for about 45 minutes. So let's get it in the oven. Set the timer. And if you guys will give me just a second to clean up a little bit, we'll start our Esther Hawsey steak. Okay, we're ready to work on Esther Hawsey steak. And um, I peruse my old cookbooks looking for things that we have forgotten or recipes that we have lost over time or heirloom recipes, however you want to describe it. And Esther Hawsey's steak is one of those. Esther Hawsey's were a very prominent political family in Hungary for years from the 1400s on up. And the man who came up with this recipe was a count. Now the story behind it is, is that they were very rich, in fact one of the richest families in Europe, and they were always having parties. And they would order things by the crate just like any restaurant would and had a whole army of servants. <clears throat> and one day they were having a dinner party and they ran out of truffles. So he came up with this recipe for the cooks to do so their guests would have something magnificent. All right, now for Esther Hawsey steak, you need three pounds of ribeye steak. And in the stories about this, it's just not any ribeye steak. It is the steak cut from the ninth rib down. Then you'll need two and a half teaspoons of salt, a cup of flour, three-fourths a teaspoon of pepper, a half a cup of shortening, and then you're going to have vegetables, and then you're going to have a gravy. And um, I would say that this may have be been the beginning of a pot roast, because you're going to do a baked steak that's not exactly a traditional baked steak. You're going to cover it with a layer of vegetables, which are simply carrots, parsnips, onions and capers, then you're going to cover that with brown gravy, then you're going to cover it with sour cream and finish baking it off. So let's get started on this. All right, we are ready to start the Esther Hawsey steak. Now everyone knows with a baked steak, you dredge your steak in flour, then you brown it on both sides, then you bake it in gravy. Esther Hawsey steak is basically the same thing, but yet different. All right, what you want to do is cover your steak with flour, and I'm gonna do a couple of them, and Jeff said he would finish them for me. And then you are going to tenderize it with a meat mallet by pounding in all of the flour. I think I can do two of them. My shoulder is not in the best of shape today. All right, now we're going to turn it over and we're going to do the same thing on the other side. Now the reason we do this is so that the meat and the crust will be crispier for a deeper depth, I guess you could say. All right, all right, let's get this.
Okay. Now, Jeff is going to finish the other stakes for me. I just wanted to show you how to do it and what the difference is. So the next thing we want to do is to prepare our skillet. We're going to put a generous cup of solid shortening. All right, we're going to put some solid shortening in our skillet and not much because all we want to do is to cook the crust. The meat is going to be baked. All right, so there you are, Jeff. As soon as this melts, we're going to dredge the meat again. So it has been dredged on each side and beat into the steak, and then we're going to dredge it again. Now, this dredge has already got salt and pepper in it in a considerable amount. So, let's bring our meat over. All right, now we have our shortening is melted. We have our steaks that have been tenderized where we pounded flour actually into the steak and we're going to dredge it one more time. Let's test our oil. Okay, when you drop flour into it, if it doesn't bubble, it's not ready. Now this is bubbling. So before I put this steak in, I am going to dredge it one more time because we want a good crust on it. That's the whole secret. Esther Hawsey steak and then I guess I'm going to have to cook them one at a time. Now Jeff is going to finish these for me while we start our spinach. Okay. Sounds good to me. <clears throat> Now what you want to do is brown these to a nice golden brown on both sides. Now one other thing, you're not cooking the steak. All you're doing is cooking the crust. That crust needs to be crisp because we've got enough flour on it to give you a good coating and the steak is going to finish cooking off in the oven. So we, uh, you only want to turn this once. And the reason for that is sometimes when you turn your floured pork chopper, floured chicken, or your floured steak, more than once, the, the crust on the first side has already been cooked, but the liquid that's inside of it is going to fall down on the steak, and then when you cook it again, your steak, the crust is going to be dropped off of it. So let's see how this is. Almost. Boy, that is a good looking piece of meat. Mm. All right, so we're going to give it one more minute, then we're going to turn it, cook it on this side, and then Jeff is going to finish them while I cook the vegetables to go on top. Okay, and here we go. Now, isn't that a beautiful piece of steak? Now, your flour has already got salt in it, eight tablespoons, of, teaspoons, I might add, and four teaspoons of pepper in it because I used eight cups of flour. And um, it's really very nice. Okay, that's going to need a moment longer. All right, let's go ahead and check that second side of our steak and see if it is ready. Now remember, you do not want to cook that first side again. That's why your crust will fall off. Our second side is lightly browned. So let's go ahead and take this off. And I'm going to pass it to Jeff, 
and we're going to drain some of the grease off of this and then we are going to cook the vegetables and I will be right back. Now you're going to drain most of the grease, in fact almost all of it, but about a tablespoon out of your skillet. You want the meat flavoring and the flour flavoring to be in your vegetables. So now this is four onions, four carrots, two parsnips, and capers. Now capers are just simply buds from a specific flower that it grows in the Mediterranean area. Uh, they are not especially good unless they have been pickled. So whenever you go to buy capers and you use some, you want to hold them with a slotted spoon and make sure the juice goes back in the jar to cover whatever is left. And all this is is just a little bit of a flavoring. All right, now, we're just going to keep tossing, mixing in the flavor of the flour, of the oil, and the meat in our vegetables. We have got parsnips, carrots, and onions. Good old-fashioned, old-timey vegetables that everyone enjoys from time to time. In fact, I found a new recipe where parsnips and carrots and celery are added to zucchini. And uh, I'm going to try that out on Dan and see if he likes that. All right, now what you're going to do, you're going to put your brown steak, your floured and brown steak in your roasting pan then you are going to dump these vegetables that have been partially cooked and seasoned, boy, if I'm not making a mess, oh, on top of them. Then you are going to put your brown gravy on top of that. Then all you're going to do is cover them and bake them for an hour, pull them out, and then you're going to just put dollops of sour cream all over the surface and put it back in for 15 minutes. So um, when I made this for Dan last time, I put baby Bella mushrooms in it, and he really liked that. So we'll see how he likes this without the Bellas. Whenever you start playing around with the recipe, to change it to something that you want and you enjoy and your family enjoys, you want to, if possible, photocopy that recipe and write on the photocopy how you changed it. And then if it works, just keep that sheet. The next time, look at it and say, all right, I think I'm going to do this and make a new photocopy or white out if you take anything out and write the new ingredients in and how you did it. And eventually over the course of a couple years, you should have that recipe absolutely perfected. Boy, that onion just doesn't want to come apart. There it is. Now all you're doing is just stir frying these a little bit. You want the flavor in. They are not going to be cooked in this skillet. They're going to be baked in the oven on top of the steak. That's why I said that I believe a pot roast came about from using this recipe and no one knows the origins of it. All right. Now I think that we are done with this. And we're going to go to our steaks. I'll be right back. All right, here are our steaks.
cakes. They have been fried, but they have not been cooked. Remember, your sole purpose for frying these steaks is to cook the crust and to make it so that it completely encapsulates your steak and holds the moisture in. All right, now, these are your parsnips, your carrots, your onions, and your capers, and we are just going to cover each one of them. And remember, these were not cooked. All we did was stir fry them in the steak oil, what little bit we did it remove, and uh, the breading. Okay, Jeff, do you want to take over here? I cannot do that. All right, now, basic brown gravy. This is made from a roux. Uh, you started out with the recipe calls for one tablespoon of solid shortening, one tablespoon of flour, one cup of beef, beef broth. So I did it times eight because I wanted more than a cup of gravy. Uh, I wanted gravy for the mashed potatoes and enough gravy to cover all of the steaks. I also put paprika in it for just a little bit extra oomph. Uh, I know that most people would have used the paprika as a garnish, but I prefer using it as a seasoning. All right, now, also when you're doing your gravy, you can buy the beef broth already made. You can cook a roast and save the broth. And if you do this, make sure you freeze it until you're going to use it on something like this. Or you can make it from beef bouillon or beef base. I made this from beef base. Now, as this heats up, it's going to run all over the place, so you don't need to put it on too thick. So you have your gravy, you have your steak, you have your vegetables. So now the only thing that's left is to cook this for an hour in the oven. Then we're going to pull it out, put some sour cream on it, and put it back in for 15 minutes. So there we are. Now, isn't that a beautiful dish? Yeah. The next dish that we're going to be looking at is going to be our, our salad portion. Now, we're making stuffed lettuce tonight. Now, we have done that before, and um, uh, we stuck very close to the actual menu that I had, which was really out of an old book. But now, this one, I have changed it a little bit. The one out of the book that I used was just simply lettuce and cream cheese and lemon juice and Worcestershire sauce and uh, a few vegetables. So I've dressed it up a little bit, and we'll see if we like this one better. Now, your ingredients are one head of iceberg lettuce, four ounces of cream cheese softened. I cut the cream cheese in half, two-thirds cup of blue cheese salad dressing or ranch dressing. I've already done the stuffed salad with the ranch dressing, so on this one it's going to be blue cheese. Salad vegetables cut up in small pieces, and you can do your salad fixings any way you want and out of any vegetables you want. And then salt and pepper to taste. All right, let's look at this. Okay, welcome back. Let's check on our cake as it's time for that buzzer to go off. I'm going to set it on 30 minutes so that the steak can finish cooking properly. And we're going to pull out our cake. Mm. 
and it went from red to brown, just like a carrot cake, goes from orangish to brownish. Boy, isn't that pretty. All right, we're gonna let this cool and then we're gonna frost it with cream cheese frosting. All right, welcome back. We have everything ready to put together our spinach madeleine. Now, uh, I have an uncle that was born in Mexico City who eventually made it to this country, became a citizen, married my aunt, and they had a wonderful family. Now, he gave us the recipes for spinach madeleine, for refried beans, his recipe for Spanish rice, and cabbage clemente, and we used all of these on our Mexican feast. Since we aren't doing a Mexican feast, I chose to leave out some of the ingredients. Now, you will need two packs of fresh baby spinach. And if you don't want to mess with the fresh spinach, go ahead and buy two of the little blocks of the frozen. Four tablespoons of butter, and this is going to be divided. Four tablespoons of flour. Two tablespoons of chopped onion. One fourth teaspoon of garlic salt. A teaspoon of Worcestershire sauce. Crushed pepper to taste optional. And since we're not fixing this with a Mexican feast, I, I'm not putting it in tonight. And one cup of shredded cheddar cheese, bread crumbs, and a half a teaspoon of salt. Now what you're going to do, now I cooked the spinach earlier and drained it as well as I could. You're going to make a roux, then make a white cream sauce, melt your cheese, add your spinach, and then we're gonna bake it off. So let's go ahead and get started on this. All right, I'll be right back. Let me get together a few more things. And welcome back. Let's get started on our cheese sauce that we're gonna be using in the Spanish Madeleine by making a roux. You're gonna start out with equal amounts of flour and butter, and we need to get that butter to melt. Do not add your flour in here until that butter has melted. It would not be good. So let's give it a second. Okay, now let's check and see if it's hot enough. Remember, all you do is a drop of flour, and if it starts sizzling, which it isn't, okay, we're going to add two tablespoons of flour, two tablespoons of butter. Mix it. Not much of a roux because we're not working with the large quantity here. So let's go ahead and add our seasonings. We have got onion, salt and pepper, Whoops, how about pepper? Here's the salt. I generally mix them together. All right, now we're gonna let these cook just a little bit. They do not have to cook very much because this is gonna be baked in the oven also. All right. Now what we are going to do is to add the 
spinach liquid. Some more spinach liquid. Oh, my nose is itching. Doesn't always happen that way. <laughs> then we're going to add our shredded cheddar cheese. Just enough for it to melt. All right, let's get this off of the fire. We're going to put in our milk, and that is pure evaporated milk. It is not uh, diluted with water. All right, let's stir this up. And the last thing we're going to add is our spinach. Now this is fresh baby spinach. Now let me give you a few little words of, of wisdom here. When you open it, open up your package, whether it's a bag or a plastic box, make sure that you pick off all the stems. The stems are the toughest part. Now on baby spinach, it's not too bad. But if you were doing another green such as kale, it is, um, I just hate cleaning kale. Because not only do you have to take the bottom of the stem apart, you have to pull the kale, the kale greens away from the stem that runs up the center. It is quite a job and quite a predicament. All right, now you want to have this mixed up as good as you can. Now your onions are not all the way done, but they are going to be baking some more. So now we have our cheese, our salt and pepper, our spinach juice, so to speak, and our evaporated milk in this. Isn't that a very nice looking cream spinach dish? Okay. We are going to empty our spinach mixture into our baking pan. And this has all your, boy that smells good. This has all of our seasonings, our cheeses, our milks, our spinach juice, onions in it. Okay. All right, we're going to spread it out. Then we're going to add breadcrumbs. Yes. Sprinkle your breadcrumbs over the top. Okay, there we are. And then we are going to put pats of butter on it. And this is your other two tablespoons of butter, guys. Now what we want is for our breadcrumbs to turn a nice golden brown. And then we're going to cover it with foil, put it in the oven, and bake it for 15 to 20 minutes. All right.
right, there we are. That doesn't even want to play well together. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to put this in the oven because it needs to dry out a little bit uncovered. And 20 minutes, it'll be ready to pull out. All right, let's check the timer. Okay, it'll be eight minutes after our meat goes off. All right, give me a few minutes to clean up, and let's go ahead and take a little bit of a break while we turn out this cake and let it cool, and then we will go from there. I think all we have left to do, Jeff is going to mash the potatoes for me, so the only thing we have left to do is to put the sour cream on our, our ribeyes and make our cream cheese frosting, and we can go meet Dan's guests and enjoy a visit in the dining room. Put the sour cream on it and then we'll put it back in there completely uncovered look at this now isn't that nice so sour cream now what you're gonna do and is put a dollop on each one until you've used it all Now this will melt and mix in with your gravy. I think next time I do this, I am going to uh, mix it in with the gravy. I may put it on the steak before the gravy. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to play with it some. Mm -hmm. All right, there we are. So this goes back in the oven uncovered for 15 minutes, and then we will have this finished. All right, let's get back to our cake. All right, this is not going to be cooked, the frosting. So you really want to glove up or make sure your hands are exceptionally clean because anything on your hands can get in the frosting, and that just is not good. So let's get our mixer assembled. And let's put our ingredients in. Okay. Whoops. All right. We have two eight ounce slabs not a square of cream cheese and it is at room temperature then a half a cup of butter at room temperature and our clear vanilla and there just is not very much here whenever you're dealing with white Mexican vanilla you need to cut the amount that you're using in half. So if it calls for a teaspoon, which this did, you use half a teaspoon. Otherwise, it just overtakes. All right, here we are. Now, because we have got powdered sugar on here, if you turn your beater on high, you are going to be given a bath in powdered sugar. So you're going to turn it on slow and turn it off three or four times until everything starts mixing together. <laughs> and once you have it mixed together, you've got most of your cream cheese in it, all the liquid, all the solids are worked into it you are going to turn it on a good medium speed and let it beat until creamy. And I love cream cheese frosting. Now I have to tell you something. 
in olden days on a real beet cake, you would cook your frosting similar to the frosting that they put on the modern red velvet cake. But I decided to do this. Okay. creamy your frosting is. This is absolutely perfect. There is not a lump in it. And what we are going to do is to put this on as if it were a glaze. Now if you are glazing a donut or a cookie with this, you probably want to add a little bit of liquid to it. I guess a bump pan wasn't the best thing to pick out for this. I enjoy fixing things that are from old cookbooks. In fact, I have one cookbook that's called Lost Recipes of America. And um, uh, I have made their gingerbread recipe and several other things over the course of time, and I really enjoy it. They have a nice little story with it, so if you ever see one, pick it up, you'll enjoy it. There we go. The spinach is ready. Then we are ready for dinner just about. Don't you? Yeah. Probably two or three. And I think we are almost through. So Jeff is going to finish everything up for me. And uh, he's going to do the mashed potatoes. And then we will be ready to go meet Dan and his guests. Now remember, our menu tonight was a stuffed lettuce salad, Esther Halsey steak, mashed potatoes, spinach madeleine, and a, boot a beet cake. Sorry. <laughs> now that may not be the best frosting job on this planet, but it's pretty good. I sometimes in my cream cheese frosting uh, put just a touch of lemon juice in it. I don't know why I didn't think of it this time. And here we are. Okay, I will. Well, first of all, thank you for joining us in the kitchen at the inn. We're going to go out and meet Dan and his guest, and I hope you'll continue staying with us and, and, uh, see how the reaction is to this marvelous food I've cooked. You have a very nice day and I'll see you out there. Well, Becky, uh, what uh, have you made up for us tonight? All right, I did a new version of stuffed lettuce salad. Stuffed lettuce salad? Right, I'm Ooh, still playing like with an awful the dessert. Big Lettuce. Her stuffing <laughs> fell out. Oh no, <laughs> oh, no I'm sorry. That's okay. I'll be mixed up anyway. Um, the first recipe I saw was out of a 
like a 1930, 1940 cookbook. And uh, there's one of these, those recipes by region, and they just took cream cheese, only I think they called it pot cheese, and mixed it with lemon juice and some sauces and packed it into it. So I've taken it from that to this. Okay. <clears throat> Well, it looks awful big. Looks well, wonderful. you were you were innovative then, I'd say. Right. Well, I, I just felt like cream cheese, and I don't care what you mix it with, isn't a good salad dressing. <laughs> well. So I cut the cream cheese this time by half, and then I added two thirds a cup of uh, a favorite salad dressing, and uh, I did ranch and blue cheese, and then I put in all of my little salad fixings. Okay. okay. Well, well that's now, amazing. Now, what looking. else are we having tonight? You're having um, Esther Halsey steak. Esther Halsey steak. Okay. It's kind of hard to say, but. It is. It's a baked steak. Esther Halsey, the family was a very prominent family in uh, Renaissance Europe all the way up to where they became absorbed by the Austrian Empire. And uh, this guy was a particular count, and they were about as rich as any family in Europe was. They have a magnificent castle still outside of Budapest. I haven't okay. been invited to it yet, but I'm going <laughs> to uh, advertise their Well, study. hopefully this show will get you to where you get enough recognition right. and, and they'll invite you. Okay. And it's like a baked steak, but it's like one that I've never seen before. And now, you first of all, you only fix it by ribeyes, and the count specified it had to be from the ribeyes from the ninth rib down. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. So I'd so. say there's a lot of wasted meat or or whatever they did with it, because aren't there just 12 well, ribs Well, I'm sure they made a too? stew or something out of okay. it. But Okay, we had the baked steak. Well, what all else right. we got? All right, we're going to have mashed potatoes. Mashed potatoes, okay. okay. Well, with gravy. And that's mm -hmm. that makes sense. And yeah. spinach madeleine. Ooh. Spanish Madeline. All right, right, tell me what that is. Um, Uncle Palumbo gave me the recipe. He, uh, he was born in Mexico City, and he came to the United States uh, after World War II and got his citizenship and married one of the girls who was a sister to my mama, and he gave me... So your uncle? My uncle. Okay. Right, so he gave me spinach Madeline, cabbage clemente, his Spanish rice, and refried beans recipe. And that's what we use in our feast, by the way, whenever we do a Mexican But that's not what we're having. Feast. We're having You're Spanish. You're having spinach <laughs> madeleine. Okay. Minus the hot peppers. Oh, well, that's good, oh, too, because I don't want well, real I'm hot sorry. peppers. She's a hot pepper freak. <laughs> well, oh, Lord, we'll, we'll send we'll Kelsey back for some this, red pepper flakes. <laughs> and, well, uh, I and sweat with them. We, we, we always worry about our guests, you know, not being, you know, being sensitive to hot peppers and stuff, so we didn't do and that. And then for dessert, we're having a real, real old-fashioned, I mean, really old-fashioned beet cake. Beet cake? Beet. Oh, my goodness. I don't know. I like beets, but I like them pickled. Well, that's good, because I took all of my leftover beets and pickled them for you today. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay. But, all right. I didn't but we're not having pickled we're beets. Not having pickled okay. beets. Okay. It's a great salad, Becky. Um, I've got uh, little tomatoes, the little uh, cherry tomatoes, right. and I've got uh, cauliflower, and of course the lettuce. And, and there's, there's a broccoli and carrots and, and carrots. radishes and. There's radishes in it. I haven't mm -hmm. seen any radishes. Is there yet. cabbage well, too? No, no cabbage. No. It's I delicious. You thought about it. Okay. You thought about it? See, the original recipe says for you to core the lettuce and reach your hand in and pull out all the leaves surrounding the core. And then pack it tight with your cream cheese. And then when it's uh, refrigerated, when it's time to serve it, cut it into wedges. Well, I couldn't do that one. I guess my hands are too fat and I couldn't get them in there to pull out <laughs> the lettuce leaves. So I cut it in half and then take out the lettuce leaves and pack it with my little mixture here and then refrigerate it. So Dan never knows what he's going to get at night because of all the innovations you come That's up right. with. And not sometimes as a guinea pig, it may yeah. not be the, the real good meal that you're looking for. 
Yeah, Dan but then it's improved for the show, right? Right. Well, sometimes, and sometimes it's what's, just for what me. What she does, she calls me about three o'clock every day. She says, "What do you want for dinner?" I say, "Well, we we had chicken the other day, and we had this or that." And I said, "Tonight, let's have beef." Okay. I come home. It's not beef. It's probably squirrel. Or, <laughs> I say, "You know, why did you ask me if uh, if you're going to change the menu?" Now, but, most of the time I fix what you want. Oh, that's true. But every now and then I just... I like to tease her about get on you know, what she does to me. Well, we have to tease the wives every once in a while just to keep keep things interesting, that's right? That's right. You know, I mean, she'll ask me what I want for dinner, and I say, I don't care. And she'll go, I asked you what you want for dinner. So, okay, you're being nice, so I'll eat. I'll make a selection, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But I like you, Becky. I like to improvise. <clears throat> and surprise him every now and then. Well, she experiments with a lot of the different meals and the different uh, uh, spices that goes in them, and, and it changes things up. And oh, yeah. Does that make us test animals? Yes. <laughs> 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 okay. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Ooh, doggy. There's a lot good. of food. Well, yes, there is a lot of food. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. That is not a Farm Bureau baked steak meal. <laughs> no, it's not. This looks like a I very feast. Esther Hawsey's instructions and got ribeyes. Okay. Now, I don't know where they are located on the rib, but. Well, I mean, every once in a while you got to just. Do we fudge have a, a steak knife with this? I don't think you need it. I bet she's got to pound it pounded down pretty hard. Well, let's see how it goes. Let's try to get the rest of them out here. You don't need it. Yeah, okay, I don't good. think, I didn't figure. Big steak gets pretty tender. Yeah. Gosh sakes, all this stuff. And baked ribeye is even more tender. And even more tender, yes. Are you going to wait on us, Big? Find out. <laughs> I yeah. had to see if it was okay. fit for human consumption. Oh, Lord. Oh, I see it. Oh, my gosh. Now the vegetables on your steak mm -hmm. are carrots, right parsnips, there. onions, and capers. Okay. Capers. The capers wow. aren't a vegetable, though. They're not. Mm -hmm. What are they? A root? No, they're a, a premature bud of a flower that grows in the Mediterranean. But wouldn't that make it vegetable matter? I don't know. I don't know if you'd consider it a vegetable or a, a seasoning. A spice. It's a plant. I would call a it a spice. spice. A spice. Maybe yeah. A spice or a seasoning. Uh, what do you call it, Shirley? What's that? A caper. A vegetable or a spice? What would you consider it? Hmm. I don't know what you call it, but it with smoked salmon. It's good. It's I a would, home run. I would, yeah, with smoked I would, salmon and cream cheese, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I would say it's a, hmm. I'd say it was a spice. All right. Let's All right. See. We'll call it a spice. All right. Let's dig in here and see what this tastes like. Sounds good. The baked steak is very good. Nice and tender. What is this uh, white sauce on it? Oh, that's uh, sour cream. Sour cream. You put yeah. sour cream on it. You're supposed to, I forgot to put it on the last one I fixed you. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I put baby bell mushrooms on yours mm. last time. Well, these don't have... Do this, does this have mushrooms on it? Mm -mm. Okay, I was going to say. No, I tried to stay true to the original recipe this time. Okay. So this is. Um, That's a parsnip and a. Parsnip and a carrot? Carrot. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to bring them out. It's warm. Mm -hmm. I like the spinach, Becky. What's mm -hmm. the? It looks like there's yeah. some kind of uh, uh, crust or uh, coating on it. What, it's what's a, that? It's breadcrumbs with butter sprinkled on it. Mm. Mm. Butter always makes things taste good, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> yes. This is enough for three people, though. Well, that, I know. Sorry, Dan. Oh. It's a, well, these steaks You're not going to get any complaints big. from me. You're not going to get any complaints from me. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Now, can't, can't Shirley know why I wasn't 
feeding them appetizers before the show. Right, yep. Mm -hmm. We had to save our ammunition for the big main course here. I know when you were talking to me on the phone on what type of meal we wanted uh, for tonight, and you mentioned this baked steak, and I, I said, well, that'd be great because, you know, when you're campaigning for com ag commissioner, you, you're going around to all the Farm Bureau dinners, and invariably most of them have a baked steak meal. That's right. Because they can feed institutionally well. It's a good meal. It's, it's tender and everything else. And, and most people really like a baked steak. And they, and they like baked steak. And I was at the annual Farm Bureau dinner one day, and it was after their campaign, and somebody asked me, they said, you know, what was the one thing you got tired of eating on the campaign trail? And I, and I said, baked steak. And the next thing you know, that's what they were serving that night for dinner, was baked steak. So when you mentioned this and the way you were going to prepare this, you might want to tell people about that, because you did something different, and this is, this is fabulous. Well, thank you. There's some gravy there if you want to pour it on you. You all should put the recipe on the next pamphlet of recipes. <laughs> well, don't you all do pamphlet of recipes and send them out periodically? Yeah, we, yeah we'll take that. That'd be great. We'll put it in our next, next book. But why don't you tell the folks how you did this a little bit? Because you did something different than a normal. Right. Well, what I did was I partially tenderized the steak with the mallet and then I sprinkled it real heavily with seasoned salt on both sides and beat that into the steak. I see. That way your crust is a little bit thicker. And then I dredged it again, fried it, and then I put it in the skillet. And after we finished all of them, we baked it. And I took the vegetables, well, this is before I baked it, I took the vegetables and stir fried them in the skillet so they would pick up some of the taste of the flour and the, uh, the oil and the meat flavoring and then put that all over the steak and then we put the gravy on it. Well, it's definitely it. di different than a, it's a different. normal baked steak. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's a, definitely a different. That's just so how I like to do it too, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> some things that's going on with the Department of Agriculture. Well, um, I think things are kind of exciting with the Department of Agriculture. We've uh, reconstituted the Agricultural Advisory Board, which is the governor, the head of extension from WVU, and uh, the commissioner of agriculture. And that is by code supposed to meet quarterly to make sure we reduce uh, duplication of effort in the state and save taxpayer monies. So I reconstituted that board. It hadn't been run in quite a while. And that board has chartered a steering committee, and we're working on developing a strategic plan for the agriculture for the state of West Virginia. This is going to be using all sorts of resources, whether it be using our natural gas and hydroponic operations, or whether how we support the small farmer uh, and the family farm in West Virginia. You know, years ago, if you look at our state flag, it was a, there's a farmer and a miner. And sadly, right. both for years were in decline. Right. But what I found also is, in looking at things, is uh, over time, you know, we had mostly farmers, you know, in, in the 1800s. And then in the Industrial Revolution came along, and people went to work in the factories and the mines even more as our mining industry grew. And the small family farm was a part time job that helped, you know, feed the family, put the kids through college. Uh, they worked hard. But as we lost mining and manufacturing jobs, they moved off these farms, and the farms kind of went away. Right. But so. But there's still a lot of. But property there's still a lot there. of property out there, and there's a lot of opportunity for a person that wants to get into agriculture. You know, uh, we're not going to be, you know, like in Iowa in a commodity crop uh, type farm, but I believe West Virginia can be a cornucopia of specialty crops. In other words, we're going to be able to. Uh, you can put a lot of money in the back of a pickup truck where it would take truckloads of corn to meet the same value. Right. And West Virginia being located within one day's drive of 60% of the population of the United States, that means that we can service an all lot. And you know, we talk in 
in the break, we were talking about how a lot of people go to restaurants and everything else now. But so they want those specialty crops. Sure. You know, West Virginia is now shipping shiitake mushrooms to New Jersey. Our maple syrup industry is, is growing. Uh, we yes. can compete with Vermont now, or the other state. I probably shouldn't say the other state's name in competitive terms. Right. But, you know, we're closer to the south. Mm -hmm. So we can ship maple syrup to the south a lot less cheaper than Vermont can ship it to the south. So there's a lot of great things like that are going on. It's difficult to find maple syrup, though, you know, the, the pure, you know, natural well, it, maple syrup. Right. Well, you're, it's going to be more and more common here in West right. Virginia over the next few years. And you just look at the, we're looking at the industry trends. Uh, dairy is growing, you know, fewer cows are producing more milk, and most of that's coming up north. In the south, there's a lot less uh, fewer dairies, but the population is growing. Right. West Virginia just stands poised. We're trying to now recruit uh, some dairy manufacturing where they can tank the raw milk in, uh, either pasteurize it, bottle it here in West Virginia, or make value-added products like cottage cheese and other cheeses, uh, yogurts, and then ship them to the south. So I think, and you have to look at these type of uh, agricultural products, those are actually factories. Right. When you're when you're processing food, right. so I'm looking for the opportunities to where we can bring, and I think our business and climate climate in West Virginia has improved, so we're we're getting poised. We just have to get the word out. We've got to talk to people. We have to tell, you know, we have to tell the West Virginia story. Right. And I think the West Virginia story is a fabulous one for years to come. We just have to let everybody know we've got hardworking people. We've got good West Virginians. We have the opportunity. In agriculture, West Virginia is no longer topography challenged because now we have the new technologies with high tunnels and hydroponics. You know, what is 30 acres under glass in hydroponics equal to field acres in California? Right. And with a year-round growing system, we don't need to worry about migrant working. We can provide year-round jobs. And then we can now have fresh tomatoes 24-7 365 days a year, just like the population demands, and we won't have to ship the picked green and ripen on the way to West Virginia. Right. But I think that's where we're going. The entrepreneur farmer, we need those guys. The guy who wants to be a farmer, but be in business to produce these things from mushrooms, bees, honey. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, apples, all of these things. Apples, and, we're getting more apple trees and, in the uh, state. The university is training agricultural students, but they don't seem to stay here. But there's 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 plenty of room here to build a farm and and make it produce and produce a living here in West Virginia. Absolutely. There's there's a lot of farm of uh, 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 old mine sites that can be made into. Um, producing uh, properties that can produce farms and, and uh, feed, feed West Virginians and all of the United States. Yeah, and you're right. And, you know, when you think about it, you know, our generation, uh, we grew up and with fewer and fewer farms feeding more and more people. That was the low-hanging fruit. I think it's the next generation that are in school right now. They're going to have the tough time. If our population goes up 70% by 2050, as everybody's projecting, those kids that are in school right now learning agriculture, uh, they're going to have the hard time. We have the low-hanging fruit. I'd like to, and I'm trying to change the course of conversation. You know, everybody knows about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I would like to change STEM to STEAM, science, technology, engineering, agriculture, agriculture. and mathematics. Very when I took office, I did a survey, it didn't cost the taxpayers a dime, but I found out that four out of four people still eat. Oh yeah. <laughs> so why have we taken agriculture out of the schools? That's true. Agriculture has to be in all the schools. It's gotta be in the high schools. We've all gotta right. get it funded in the high schools, our VOAG teachers, we've gotta get it funded in the college. And if you go to a lot of the counties right now, those kids coming out of the ag programs, they're just tremendous. And not all will go back to a farm, not all will go into agriculture, but what also happens though, when they graduate, they graduate as an educated consumer. And I think that is so very important for people to understand the food supply. 
Well, it's a security issue too. The most of the most of the consumers today are becoming very wise about uh, all the additives and things. And if you grow them yourself, and right. you know what you've got, and all that. And we eat nice, wholesome, healthy foods like we're eating tonight. We can save on our health care costs down the road. So you may pay a little bit more for your food if you're buying locally and not using all the imported foods. But think about the money we're going to save in health care at the same time. True. It's going to take a generation, but I think we can do it. Well, let's uh, get our salad coming. and I mean, our dessert. I'm sorry. And uh, let's uh, finish up eating what we've got here, and we'll get our salad. I'm our, about full our dessert. with this. I'll do the dessert. Okay. Well, what are we having like now? Back, so. We're having an old-fashioned beet cake. Beet cake. With okay. cream cheese frosting. All right. Is it made with beets? It is. It doesn't look like it's beets. Well, they brown when they're cooked. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Believe, <laughs> believe me, there are beets in this. So believe what me, there's beets in there. Mm -hmm. And what, what's the, uh, the uh, cream ice? cheese frosting. Cream mm -hmm. cheese frosting. Originally, the beet cakes used a boiled frosting like the uh, Waldorf Astoria when they developed the red velvet okay. cake of today and they just used that frosting because they did not have cream cheese and mixers and whatever back in the day. So uh, I went with cream cheese because I like it. Okay. Well, let's try it and uh, Tom, uh, I know you're awful full but you better try to eat that cake. Well, Just think carrot cake, it's, all, guys. It's, like a, it's like a miracle. I always seem to find room for Miss Becky's desserts. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, speaking of good food, I know that uh, Kent and, and Shirley, that y'all have had a family farm for a long time. I'm sure you had some good food. And Shirley, why don't you tell us some of your favorite parts about owning a farm and, and uh, you know, maybe some of the good foods that y'all had out there? <clears throat> well... Having the farm, we had uh, cows, sheep, and goats. And of course, my favorite thing, being a, a woman, was the babies, the uh, lambs and the kids. And uh, watching them grow and run and play in the fields. And I love to cook, and I like to experiment with different things. And one of the things that I really have a special recipe for is a lamb stew. Mm. And it's not a traditional lamb stew. It's made with, uh, you know, your typical onions and tomatoes and garlic and thing like that. But your starch is not your potatoes and your carrots. It's garbanzo beans. Oh, interesting. Which gives it a different flavor. And it has different spices than what you would normally put. Mm -hmm. You have curry, you have cumin, mm -hmm. and you have mint. Oh, that sounds good. So it, it's it's a really different kind of a lamb stew. That sounds like a good main meal for our next cooking show with, with Kent and Shirley. <laughs> well, that, that would be fine. That would be fine with Kent. That would be fine. <laughs> yeah, but tell, when you do your cooking, what do you really like to do when you get your spices? Where do you get a lot of your spices? Well, we have our own herb garden, mm. and uh, we have the usual, the parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. And I just go out to the uh, herb garden and cut it. Well, you you're so really, we use the fresh stuff. You guys are really leading by example then. Yeah. Well, we're trying. That's great. Yeah, yeah. we uh, we enjoy it there. I, I I love public service, but I do miss some of the things back home while I'm doing the public service. But it's it's been rewarding. Yeah. Well, that's uh, we we appreciate it. You know, it, it, it takes good people serving their fellow man to make our communities great and our state great and so we appreciate it well thank you very much We're thank you and we have enjoyed this immensely and hopefully we can come back again okay you're always welcome well it's great it's a great uh, dessert pick it's, it's awesome very good it's yep. very good okay well, thank you that is a good dessert it doesn't even taste like beets <laughs> yeah i know it doesn't taste it does. like it tastes more like a carrot cake. carrot cake it does yeah I very know. good we well, thank you so much for the and invitation and, and Tom, thank you so much. Yeah, we're, we're so happy that you all were able to come It's great to be here. Enjoy a, a good meal with us. I look thank forward you. to those squirrels. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, call us and let us know when, you know, when 
things are good for you for the squirrel dinner. Okay. okay. All right, we we'll can do, do that. that. All right. Okay. Well, thanks for watching Dining with Dan and Becky at the Glen Fair Sin. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks Thank for watching. You. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye.